When I first started this channel, I had no idea what sort of videos I was going to make. All I knew was that I wanted to talk about video games. I didn't want to necessarily review games per se, because a lot of other people do an exceptional job of that, and I just wasn't up to the task. But now, after making 25 videos, I think it's time to take a real stab at it. To sit down and look at a video game as a whole and judge it based on what I think and what I played. As you've probably seen by the title of this video, it's going to be The Witcher 3. Wow, so original Sean, I know. There are a lot of people out there that have talked extensively about The Witcher 3. Some of those videos even being the length of the Lord of the Rings extended edition films, and those movies are almost going on four hours each. Here's the thing though, it wasn't until I started playing through The Witcher 3 again for this video after only finishing it up last year for the first time that I realised why these videos were so long. The Witcher 3 is by far one of, if not the biggest game I have ever played. That's not even including both the expansion DLCs, add another 60 hours on top of the hundreds of hours of playtime. If you want to do an in-depth review of everything in this game, that includes the story, the gameplay, the characters, the choices you can make, the glitches and the bugs you found, as well as your opinion on the game as a whole, then of course your video is going to be hours long. I'm currently starting this review on the 25th of August 2020, so by the time I finish this script, reread through it a few times, make some changes to it as I go, then I'll probably play through the entire game again to get the footage for the video, then I'm probably looking upwards of a month to two months to finish this video, maybe even more. The question you're also asking is, why The Witcher 3? If so many other people have talked about it, then what's the point in making another video about it? Well firstly, I wanted to play through the game again in preparation for the release of Cyberpunk. That game is my most anticipated game of this year, like it is for a lot of people. So I thought playing through some of CD Projekt's old games was a good idea. And I have fond memories of The Witcher 3, so I thought it was time to talk about it. And secondly, I wanted the challenge. To make a big project like this takes time and a lot of effort. Alright, so let's get down to it. I hope I haven't babbled on too much at the start of this video, I just wanted to give some context on why I'm making this thing in the first place. So without further ado, this is my review and critique of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. So, firstly, what the hell is a Witcher? I think a lot of you that are watching this video have either already played The Witcher 3, or Witcher 1 and 2, or at least have read the books, or watched the Netflix show. While The Witcher series of books by Andrzej Sapowski have been around since 1993, they only really became mainstream because of the video games. That might not be true when it comes to people living in Poland, where the books are held at as a high regard as J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. But for me, who reads a lot of fantasy novels, The Witcher series has never really thrown at me as the must-read books of that genre. Isn't to say they're not good books, because they definitely are. I just never heard of The Witcher at all until The Witcher 3 came out. Now, I might actually be in a minority of people that review or critique these games because I've only read one Witcher book, The Last Wish, which is a collection of short stories before the main Witcher story. Then I stopped reading it. It didn't grab me as much as other fantasy series like The Wheel of Time and, of course, The Lord of the Rings did. I should probably be reading them right now, but I'm on the last book of the Stephen King's Dark Tower series and there's no way I'm going to be reading anything else at this point. And I have no intention of going back and playing the old games like a lot of people have before reviewing the third game. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think you can be completely versed in the Witcher universe to enjoy The Witcher 3. Well, knowing the context of the story and characters in The Witcher 3 make it more fulfilling experience? Yeah, sure, but I don't think you have to if you don't want to. I know a lot of fans of The Witcher right now are screaming blasphemy at the screen, but I don't think you should be pressured into playing the old games or reading the books. I still think The Witcher 3 is one of the best games I have ever played. It's definitely not THE best game, we'll get to that in a little bit. That top spot is reserved only for Outer Wilds, sorry CD Projekt. 
But playing it by itself is perfectly fine, because off the bat The Witcher 3 is the best fantasy action RPG that has ever been made. Some people would say that the best fantasy RPG is Divinity Original Sin 2. I agree that the storytelling in Divinity is some of the best in the industry, but it's held back by its isometric turn-based combat. Where The Witcher 3 fumbles with its story in some parts, its gameplay elevates it to another level entirely. But to answer my original question at the start of this chapter, what is a Witcher? Witcher is a person that has undergone extensive and rigorous training, ruthless mental conditioning, and that undergoes magical rituals to make their reflexes almost superhuman. They undergo all of this to become monster slayers for hire. In the world of the Witcher, monsters have entered the Earth through a magical event called the Conjunction of the Spheres, and it's up to the Witchers to hunt and kill these magical beasts. Of course, there is more to them than just that. The entire Witcher universe is full of witches and wizards, dragons, and enough political intrigue it would make George R. R. Martin wet the bed at how complicated it all is. Here's the thing, as soon as you add magic and politics together, especially the medieval politics, it starts to all get very confusing. The Witcher bases a lot of its magic and stories around old fairy tales or nursery rhymes. A lot of them are obviously old Polish tales, but in the games a lot of them are pretty recognisable to most people that grew up with old children's books. So these old tales mixed in with magic and politics and war and a bunch of almost superhuman people running around and killing monsters sounds like an interesting premise, and it is especially for a video game. In the games, we are told these stories with the perspective of one witcher in particular, Geralt of Rivia. Well, not all the time. It seems you might be being told the story through Dandelion the Bard, who is a good friend of Geralt, but has a tendency to over-exaggerate and stretch some facts of what really happened. Because The Witcher 3 gets real weird sometimes, but we'll get to that in a while. Geralt, nicknamed the White Wolf, is a witcher from you guessed it, the School of Wolf. There are a few other different schools like School of Viper, but most witcher schools are now either gone or destroyed, so there are no new witches being created. Geralt at the start of the Witcher 3 is about 40 years old. He's been doing the whole witcher thing for a long time now, but you wouldn't know it because witches don't age like normal humans. Now you have the basics of who our main character is. Don't worry, I will go into more detail about the different characters you meet and expand on who Geralt is throughout the review. So the Witcher 3 starts with Geralt and Vesemir searching for Yennefer of Vendor. And this is where our analysis actually begins. The beginning of The Witcher 3 starts like most RPGs do, with a flashback and a whole lot of exposition. We begin with a CGI cutscene. A cloaked figure that we know as Yennefer is racing a horse through a forest and suddenly comes out into a battlefield with two armies on either side. One of the armies charging the other on horseback. Vasir uses her powerful magic to escape the battle and she drops a magical crow skull she used to kill one of the Nilfgaardian soldiers. We then fade to show Geralt and Vesemir sleeping under a tree beside a campfire. The game zooms in on Geralt and we led into a dream sequence that doubles as the game's tutorial. We are introduced fully to Geralt and Yennefer and the game lingers for quite a long time on Yen. We go and talk about later how the Witcher hypersexualizes women with extremely revealing clothing, but I'm going to wait until a bit later when I can show more examples. We also meet Ciri, the person who the entire plot of the third game revolves around. You see, Ciri is a child of the Elder Blood, and that Elder Blood has the ability to transport her to different worlds and dimensions across time and space. Ciri is being pursued by the Wild Hunt so they can use her blood to herald in the White Frost, an end of the world event that destroys all worlds and brings about an age of calamity. Ciri's blood can be used to speed up this event as well, that's why the Wild Hunt needs to capture her. But guess what? Barely any of this is told to you until the final acts of the game. I just want to tell you now because it becomes extremely important even though the game doesn't think it needs explaining. In the dream sequence, Ciri is a kid and is being trained by both Geralt and the old witcher Vesemir in the school of the wolf, Kaer Morhen. The tutorial sets up Ciri's and Geralt's relationship. Ciri sees Geralt as her father figure. We also see Ciri's mischievous behaviour when she sneaks away from Vesemir when he's sleeping, when she's meant to be studying, as well as her skill with a sword. She's on her way to becoming a witcher and it shows. The tutorial section gives us the basics of combat, but I just want to pause for a second and talk about the combat of the game. 
The Witcher 3's combat plays like a weird version of Batman Arkham Asylum's free flow combat. You can counter enemies and go it will alternate between enemies in the direction you point your mouse or thumbstick. You also have gadgets. In The Witcher 3's instance, you select between spells, a crossbow, and bombs. But it also plays a little bit like a Soulsborne game, where you dodge and roll around enemies to stab them in the back, and you can use potions to give you health, but you only have a certain amount of them. I started playing Bloodborne recently, and it has such refined combat that when I play The Witcher 3, it feels like I'm flailing about trying to hit something. It's crazy to me that these two games came out in the same year and are both so popular but have such a different approach to combat. One is tight and responsive while the other is slow and annoying a lot of the time. There are times in The Witcher 3 where I won't even be near an enemy swinging a sword or a monster stamping its jaws at me and I'll still get hit by the attack. And five years on, this hasn't been fixed at all. What I'm trying to say is I don't like The Witcher 3's combat that much. I think it's fine and it at times can be enjoyed especially if you're fighting a huge monster or something, but it's definitely not the best. A way to improve the combat might be to make it more rhythm based like the Arkham games. Focus more on dancing between enemies in free flow combat like it's described in the books. You can still use your powers, but those can be used on the fly rather than having to stop mid action to cast a spell. I recently beat Coast of Tsushima and even though it's completely unfair to compare a game that came out 5 years ago to a modern third person action game, I feel that Ghost has refined what CD Projekt set out to do with The Witcher 3. In Ghost, the combat is swift and precise each blade strike is perfectly calculated, and of course in that game you change stances depending on what sort of enemy you're fighting. And isn't that almost what was going on in the books of The Witcher? Geralt would change stances depending on who he was fighting. I just hope that in the future CD Projekt goes back to making Witcher games after Cyberpunk that they change the way in which combat works in the game, as long as they keep this voice line in though. Damn you're ugly. Anyway, back to the story. Midway through your dream, the Wild Hunt shows up and attacks Ciri. Geralt wakes up with a start, then it's off to White Orchard. No! The entirety of the White Orchard section is a second tutorial, but it mostly revolves around the Griffin. Geralt and Vesemir are attacked by the Griffin as soon as they leave their camp on the road. Caught in the middle of all this is a merchant whose goods have been splattered all over a small creek and whose horse is carried away by the Griffin at the end of the encounter. The Griffin even wounds Vesemir slightly, but the merchant offers up some gold for compensation. You are then given your first option in the game to choose what sort of witcher you think Geralt is. Do you accept the gold, or do you leave it for the merchant that just lost his horse and a lot of his stock? This is a good way to introduce the player to the choices in the game. Up until now you could pick different dialogue options, but they have no real impact at all. Here though, the player begins to decide who Geralt is as a person. Let me just explain White Orchard for a second. It's a weird place when you compare it to the rest of the game. It's almost like a dreamlike sequence. Not like Dessant in the bottom wine DLC, but in its own weird way. The sky is mostly clear and full of hope in this section. Some modders on PC have even made mods to give the rest of the game the same weather effects that happen in White Orchard. Not only that, but the entire place seems too peaceful. Don't get me wrong, there are tensions brewing here. The war is right around the corner and at any moment the Nilf Guardians could come around and burn the whole village to the ground. And there's a few monsters hanging around as well as the Griffin. But it's mostly not a bad place. It's the perfect setup for what's to come. You have free roam around the entire area. You can explore and uncover secrets. You can also do some small missions to give you an idea of what to expect from side missions in the game. But you can also do your first Witcher contract. Witcher contracts are my favourite part of the entire game. It usually requires you to head to a location to investigate where the monster might be, then prepare yourself for battle using a glossary with information on the monster and what its weaknesses are. This Witcher contract is called The Devil by the Well. You have to go investigate an old abandoned village, you find out details of this devil, and you actually find out it's a noon wraith that is haunting the area. Then you find her bones and perform a ritual to summon the wraith. You can put spectre oil on your silver sword to do more damage as well as cast Yodin, which is a magic trap, to do even more damage to the wraith. The battle is quick and ferocious, and depending on how much you prepared before the fight, you can either succeed and send the wraith on its way, or fail and have to try again. I think the CD Projekt outdid themselves with the Witcher contracts. I feel like they did exactly what Sapowski was describing in the books. Confrontations with monsters should be taken seriously. Most of them are deadly and can kill you in a few strikes. 
But as I'll explain later on, not all Witcher contracts have to end with a flash of a silver sword and a pool of blood. You can finish some Witcher contracts by using your wits and sometimes stopping a monster simply by talking to them. As I've said numerous times before, we'll get to that later. The main quest in White Orchard mostly focuses around trying to find Yennefer. You're introduced to the North Guardians, or the invading army in this land, and asking for resources from the locals. You see the commander, Peter Gwynlev, asking a local farmer for as many bags of rain that he can offer the army. He seems polite enough, and he even tells Geralt that he knows where Yennefer is, but firstly, the witch must deal with the griffin. Geralt reluctantly agrees, and you head back to the inn. The local inn is your central base to explore the surrounding area. Here you can talk to different people sitting around the inn as well as a place to buy your resources for potions and a place to store your belongings you don't need in your inventory. It's here you meet Gauntor Odim, who knows both Geralt and Yennefer by name. He calls himself but a simple mirror merchant, or the Man of Mirrors. Gauntor will become more important to the story later on. You can also come across a man playing Gwent, which is The Witcher 3's brand new meta minigame. Geralt doesn't quite know it yet, but this is the start of a serious addiction to the card game, and for me as well. You see, Gwent is a trading card game, essentially like Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh. Funnily enough, people loved Gwent so much the CD Projekt releases as a standalone game that you can even play on your phone. Here's a brief overview of Gwent. Two players have a deck of cards. Each deck is based on different factions from The Witcher. There's the Northern Realms, the Squaretales, Skelligar, Nilfgaard, and the Monsters. You can find cards of the game to build decks, but at the start you just have the Northern Realms. Each player decides how many cards they want to have in their deck when the round starts. The goal is to win two rounds by having a higher number than the other player does. Each card has a power number that you can see at the front, as well as what sort of class it is. One might be a close quarters swordsman, so when you place him down, he'll be at the front of the table and will give you a score of one. But here's the catch, each player only gets 10 cards for the entire game. At the start of the round, the game randomly picks which cards you're going to be playing from your deck, so you have to be tactical and cautious of which cards you should use. If your opponent gets a really high score, sometimes it's better just to pass and lose that round so you can hold onto your high numbered cards for the next round, and hope that the person you're playing has already used up all their high numbered cards. There's a bunch of other mechanics like weather effects, like fog or rain that affects different classes and lowers their power level down, or leader cards having different powers throughout the match, like being able to bring in an additional card from your deck. It's a really interesting game type and I love to play it. It does feel disconnected from the rest of the game in some parts though. Most of the cards are actually people from the games and books that Geralt has met or sometimes even killed. You can even get Geralt himself as a card at one point during the game. I think as many games go, Gwent is by far the best one I've seen in any game. It's refreshing to see something different when it's so easy for mini games to be boring. I'm looking at you Skyrim. And the great thing about Gwent is you're not forced into playing it at all. My first entire playthrough of The Witcher 3 I never even touched Gwent because I wanted to go out and kill monsters. But in the second playthrough it's all I've been doing. I've been going to every merchant I can see to see what sort of cards they have available so we can start new decks. I've never been one to be collecting and actually playing a card game. I collected and traded Pokemon cards as a kid in primary school, but I never bothered to learn and play. It just never really interested me. But Gwent has. I've even downloaded it on my phone and I'm even looking into purchasing proper physical cards to be able to play. My only real problem with Gwent is that quite a few of the earlier opponents you do challenge are almost impossible to beat with a simple deck, and you need to come back to them later on to try and win, but most of the time it isn't worth going back because the prize pool is so low, even if you get the maximum amount of coins you can. Gwent is so addictive that it spawned thousands of memes about how the fantasy RPG part of the game is the minigame, and Gwent is the actual point of The Witcher 3. But all of this does make me question why CD Projekt made a standalone Gwent game for mobile. And of course, the only answer I can think of is... money. Now here is probably my most controversial take about The Witcher and CD Projekt. I think CD Projekt makes good games, but I don't think they're as good as a company that people think they are. Most recently, their newest game, Cyberpunk 2077, was delayed for the third time in a year. Now, I'm not complaining about the delay per se, what I am complaining about is the fact that the developers have had to work up to 100 hour work weeks to make sure the game is playable. I don't even want to think about how much crunch the developers had to do on top of the DLC for The Witcher 3 to develop Gwent. Now, I'm pretty outspoken against crunch. I think it's a failure of the heads of the companies and the publishers that force developers to work overtime and cuts down developers' time spent with families and loved ones, just to make sure the game runs. It's an inexcusable part of the video game industry and it should never happen. The reason I'm adding this to the video is because CD Projekt is held up in the eyes of consumers as the gold standard for a triple A game company. They do a lot of good things like making their games DRM free on GOG and not adding microtransactions to their games like a lot of other companies are these days. Well, 
not yet anyway. But it's become increasingly obvious to everyone that CD Projekt might talk the talk, but not walk the walk. Last year the heads at CD Projekt told journalists they would be minimising crunch in every possible way they could, but then in 2020 he turned around and said that a lot of developers would be doing mandatory crunch to make sure Cyberpunk is finished on time. Then a week ago they delayed the game again, making those same developers crunch even more. On top of that, the CEO of CD Projekt and a call to investors said that crunch was not that bad, and never was. Also stating that it's only Q&A, engineers, and some programmers that are crunching, as if that makes it better. I'm not even going to comment how Q&A always get the brunt of the crunch and the most overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated developers in the entire industry. Don't worry, he apologized to employees and consumers, so that makes it better, right? Right? No, it doesn't. So why am I explaining this to you when I should be talking about The Witcher? What I want you to remember is The Witcher 3 was probably made with the same amount of crunch as Cyberpunk is. Now I'm going to be pretty critical of The Witcher and the rest of this video, and that doesn't mean I think the developers hard work should be dismissed just because they crunch to do it. What I do want you to think about is this game was made with crunch. All of it. And no matter how good the game is, it will always be scarred by the failures of the management at CD Projekt. Your stay in White Orchard ends with an extended battle against the Griffin. Same as with the Noon Race, you need to collect a type of weed called Buckthorn to lure the Griffin into a field and use spells and a crossbow that Vesemi gives you just before the fight. The crossbow might be one of the weakest weapons in the game, and it's only really useful against flying monsters, which aren't very frequent at all anyway. It isn't even very strong against normal humans either, which is a weird choice to make considering it's a literal arrow being fired at high speed and should easily impale anyone that it hits. Monsters I can understand because they're big but should definitely do more damage against humans. I feel like that maybe at one point CD Projekt had the crossbow do more damage and take more time to reload, but decided that it was too easy of a weapon to abuse. So instead, let Geralt be able to fire and reload it quickly, but it does little to no damage, maybe only stun enemies. Other than that, it's useless in a fight, and I would rather it be slow reloading and maybe only be able to fire a certain amount of ammo before you run out and ultimately be more powerful. Or just scrap it completely and just let us use our magic on flying enemies instead. Even when Geralt is given the crossbow, he says to Vesemir, Welcome. Wait. Wait this. A crossbow. Won it in a card game while you ran around. Might come in handy. A witcher with a crossbow? We break him with tradition? Stop talking. Got a griffin to kill. It's as if even Geralt knows how useless it is and was perfectly fine killing griffins up until this point with swords and magic. Anyway, the fight against the griffin really isn't anything to write home about. You simply hit it with as much damage as you can, dodge it out of the way of its attacks, and shoot it out of the sky before it can swoop down at you. About halfway through the fight, the griffin will fly off towards a windmill on the hill and you have to follow. I can still remember how broken The Witcher 3 was on launch. I remember when I got to this part in 2015, the whole game froze with Vesemir on his horse with his head like 20 metres away from him, and the griffin also frozen in its landing animation. Back then I managed to kill the griffin while it was frozen to finish the fight and everything went back to normal. Vesemir's head back on his shoulders as well, thank god. But with this playthrough, it was how it was meant to be, just more dodging and attacking and shooting down the griffin before it could attack me. You eventually will kill the griffin and end the fight. I think as a whole, the Devil by the Well contract is a better tutorial on how most Witcher contracts will turn out throughout your playthrough. At least with the Noon Race, you have to actually prepare for the fight without knowing exactly how the fight is going to turn out. Plus, I prefer non-scripted events instead of just showing us the griffin and letting Vesemir do all the work setting up the bait and such. The Noon Wraith actually takes detective work to figure out what happened and the player can actually come to the conclusion of what happened to the lady before she died. With the griffin, there's a moment where you find its nest with the corpse of its female partner beside it. Gerald exclaims that the nest was probably burnt by humans, but it never gets expanded on. Was it Nilfgaardian soldiers near the nest that the griffin slaughtered, or was it the townsfolk trying to force the griffin away? And who even killed the female griffin? If it takes two veteran witches to take down one griffin, then who took this one down? You never find out any of this. 
Anyway, you take the head of the griffin to the Nilf Guardians and witness the same farmer that was to supply the army with grain being chastised by Gwynlev for bringing them rotten grain instead. The farmer is then dragged away to be lashed. This shows a different side to Nilf Guardians. They are the invading army here, remember, and they are asking the people whose families fought against the Nilf Guardians and were probably killed by them to hand over the only remaining food they have. And Geralt even comments on this. Guess you've dropped your good uncle act. It was no act. I extended a hand to these people. They spat on it. Could it be because it held the sword that killed their loved ones? Tch! A moralist. And what would you do in my stead? Wouldn't ever be in your stead. Tell me why you've come. Geralt is still paid and given the information he seeks. Yennefer is in Vizima. Geralt then rides back to the inn to tell Vesemir the good news. Upon entering the inn, it seems like Vesemir is on edge about something. He tells Geralt that things in the town seem tense, and they should leave and not get involved. In the end though, the people in the inn turn on the two witches, and we see the anti-witcher sentiment come to light. They call them mutants and freaks, and advance on the two witches with weapons drawn. There's no actual way to stop this from happening, you can't cast Axie on these opponents either. It's one of the rare moments in The Witcher 3 where I think that spell would have come in handy. Geralt uses it all the time on different people, so it's not as if he can't use it, and Vesemir is there as well, so two witches using the sign would have easily stopped the fight outright. But CD Projekt wants this fight to happen, and once you kill all the aggressors in the end, the other patrons are terrified of you. One starts throwing up at the side of the mutilated corpses you left in your path, and the innkeeper tells you to leave and never come back as she cowers in the corner. The same people Geralt saved by killing the griffin are now terrified of him. It also shows that even though you think you're doing the right thing in this game, it may lead to dire, unforeseen consequences. After you step out of the inn, you come face to face with a bunch of Nilfgaardian soldiers, and with them is Yennefer. You head to Vizima with her while Vesemir heads back to Kaer Morhen. This is where the plot for the actual game starts to pick up. I think of White Orchard as the tutorial for The Witcher 3 because there's no real plot happening in it except to set up Geralt as a character if you don't know anything about him and to meet up with Yennefer. Anyway, the group is attacked on their way to Vizima by the Wild Hunt and Geralt and Yennefer are the only two to escape. Vizima is basically all plot driven at this point. No real gameplay happens here except for you choosing a bunch of different dialogue options for events that happened in the previous games. This is actually quite important because some options actually have whole characters not shown up in The Witcher 3 if you choose them. Letho is a good example. He was essentially the main villain in the previous games, I use that term very lightly. If you choose the option that you killed him at the end of Assassins of Kings, then a whole quest with him later on is totally removed from the game. This isn't a new thing to have in an RPG, but I think The Witcher 3 handles it really well. It's payoff for people that have played the old games as well as a minor incentive for newer players to look up the history of the series or even go back and play the old games. There is one major plot detail that happens, and it's why the events of the Wild Hunt unfold in the way that they do. Amir, King of the Nilfgaardians, wants Geralt to find Ciri and bring her back to Nilfgaard to fulfil a prophecy. That prophecy sees Amir marrying Ciri and then producing a child which will go on to rule the entire world. There are many discussions online about all this, that Amir is actually Ciri's father, but that he was cursed. Geralt cured him of his curse, and as his reward claimed the Law of Surprise, which means that the first baby that Amir and his wife have is immediately Geralt's, which of course is Ciri. So Amir hates Geralt for this, but knows he will find Ciri regardless whether he wants to or not. We could go into the whole incest stuff and how it's weird and creepy, but we won't go into that here. Geralt is then sent to the war-torn land of Valon, and that's where our first chapter ends and the biggest area of the game begins. Velen is the biggest explorable area in The Witcher 3. To put it in perspective, it's as big as Skyrim and Red Dead Redemption 2, and only the tiniest bit bigger than GTA 5, and that's saying something. I find the comparisons especially interesting. If you compare The Witcher 3's open world to that of Red Dead 2's, then you're going to get a lot more similarities than differences. I don't mean one to judge a game on the size of its map, but The Witcher 3 tends to go out of its way to make its playable areas as interesting as possible up close. 
close. Where I don't think it holds up is when you see these locations from far away. While The Witcher 3's world is visually stunning, its explorable areas never really interested me that much. I can tell you a few memorable locations I went to in The Witcher 3, except for Tassant, but we'll get to that in the DLCs, and that's it. But I can remember getting lost in the great Hyrule Forest in Breath of the Wild and seeing Solitude from a distance for the first time in Skyrim. The Witcher 3 has none of these real go out and explore for yourself sort of moments. Even on my second playthrough where I turned off the minimap and tried to find my way by talking to people and hoping they would give me directions or looking at road signs to see if I was going in the right direction, I still had to open my map so much that it almost became impossible not to have the minimap on at all times. Even though I do think it's a good idea to turn off the map marker so you don't simply follow the dotted line to your next objective and for immersion purposes, the game still seems like it was built to make you follow the roads no matter what. Locations in games like Breath of the Wild and even Skyrim stand out on the horizon so you as the player are actively drawn to them from a distance. The Witcher 3 has a few of these moments, but most of the time interesting areas are hidden in large forests that are so dense you wouldn't even know there was something in there unless you actively looked at your map. You may be saying that this seems picky, and maybe it is, but I barely ever went out of my way on my first playthrough to go to these locations. If they weren't on my immediate road, then I wasn't going to bother with them. If you've been playing for 60 plus hours, then going out of your way to a little random location that isn't that interesting is going to seem pointless. But where The Witcher 3 doesn't fail is the immersion of the world. Every small town and farm seems straight out of a fantasy novel like Lord of the Rings. There's people going about their business during the day, going to the tavern in the evening, than going to bed at night. It reminds me a lot of what Bethesda were trying to succeed with in Oblivion and Skyrim. NPCs having actual lives and seemingly places to go and things to do makes the world seem alive. And The Witcher 3 feels exactly like that. Going from the forests to the swamps and battlefields to the bustling city streets is something that CD Projekt should be praised for. A lot of fantasy RPGs will often talk about how the capital cities of their world will be bustling and full of people, but will end up only having a few NPCs walking around, making the city feel empty. I know this may be because of game engine limitations, but CD Projekt's engine, their red engine, is capable of bringing these bustling cities to life. We'll hopefully see more of this in Cyberpunk as well, but that's for another time. When you first enter Valon, you actually end up in the middle of the map. It's an interesting choice to make the player start directly in the middle of your map, but it does give you freedom to literally go in any way you want. From the get-go, you're not immediately funneled down a path that the game desperately wants you to follow. It does nudge you in the direction of the main quest, but you can turn that quest marker off and go exploring. On my first playthrough, I went straight to the next main mission, but my second, I slowly went from town to town, seeing what problems people may be having and actively going my way to collect more Gwent cards and challenge people to play when there was nothing else to do. If you've watched the Netflix series or read the books, then this is pretty much what a Witcher does, minus the Gwent. They go from town to town looking for work and trying to make as much gold as possible. My first playthrough was a blur of trying to do the main quest as well as trying to upgrade my gear and swords. This playthrough was a lot more relaxed. I took my time and let the game immerse me in the world. Even though the game doesn't do a good job showing the player where to go using points of interest they can see without looking at the map, CD Projekt really nailed the immersion part of The Witcher 3. Instead of just babbling on about how good the open world is in The Witcher 3, I'll just give you an example. During the early hours of my second playthrough, I was riding along the sunny coastside heading towards an unknown location on the map. I rounded a corner and in front of me is an old burnt out white house with a wyvern circling around it. I caught the attention of the wyvern and it swooped down to attack me. The thing was about 7 levels above Geralt's current character level so the fight was going to be tough. I used my shield sign and started attacking it, dancing around it if it went to lash out at me and shooting it out of the sky with my crossbow when it went to swoop down at me. Shout out to the developers that implemented the weather system into the game because there's before the sky darkened and it started to pour with rain, making it seem like we've been fighting for hours instead of just minutes. One good strike was enough to kill Geralt instantly, but after a few close calls and a good shot from my crossbow, the thing was dead, and for my efforts I gained instructions on how to craft new special armour and a new sword. Getting the quest to craft the armour can lead on to another quest that leads into another town that leads onto another quest, and so on and so forth. The Witcher 3 is very good at handing out quests as well as giving the player incentive to do those quests when they find them. And the quests themselves are varied. One moment you're helping a man find his goat, and the next you're fighting a wraith in the middle of the field at midnight. No quests feel the same, which is refreshing when you compare it to other modern RPGs. If you look at a game like Fallout 4, they have endlessly spawning side quests that you can never really fully finish because the developer wants you to 
to play the game for as long as possible. But all that wasted development time in implementing that system could have been time spent making a unique quest for players to experience. The Witcher 3 has none of this, and every quest you're given feels like it was given the love and attention it deserves. Speaking of quests, I want to highlight one of the best quests you can encounter throughout your entire playthrough. Trust me when I say that The Witcher 3 is so full of incredible quests it's almost impossible to narrow it down to just one. If I were to talk about them more we would be here for hours and I just don't have time for that. I think the quest that comes to mind the most whenever I think of The Witcher 3 is actually a quest from pretty early on, and it's of course the Bloody Baron questline. Now a lot of this quest is part of the main quest. Geralt is given information once he gets to Valon the Bloody Baron and the Witch in Crookback Bog might have seen Ciri at some point recently, so your trail will lead you to the Bloody Baron's Fort, Crow's Perch. The first time I met the Baron, I immediately rolled my eyes because his descriptive title matched exactly what he looked like. The Baron is wearing large red armour. He is a huge man, probably as big as some of the trolls that you come across in your playthrough. I instantly took a disliking to the Baron, and I was worried on my first playthrough that the character would be so on the nose that it would be unbearable to be around in a largely forgettable character. How wrong I was. The Baron is one of the most nuanced and interesting characters in the entirety of The Witcher 3. Unlike most missions, the Baron's questline starts off with you investigating the whereabouts of his missing wife and daughter. You quickly uncover that the Baron often beat his wife, and this had led to her having a miscarriage. This is probably the reason why she ran and took their daughter with her. And while this in itself is a heavy theme to have in an RPG, The Witcher 3 takes it further. You suddenly have to deal with the aborted child that has changed into a mutated monster called a botchling. But the quest doesn't end there. You end up travelling all over Valen in search of Anna and Tamara. You end up heading to Oxenfurt for the first time, one of Valen's smaller cities. And then heading into the foggy marshes of Crookback Bog where you come face to face with a bunch of crones that seem to have popped right out of a children's fairy tale. The crones, incidentally, had also come into contact with Ciri after she accidentally teleported to Crookback Bog and was almost killed by the crones so that they could taste her elder blood. All of this is mixed in with the character drama with the Baron. You can even come to sympathise with him a tiny bit when asking about his relationship with his wife. He tells you how he went away to war and when he came back found out that Anna had been sleeping with his best friend. So the Baron killed him, tore him to shreds in fact, and threw his body to the dogs. From then on, Anna had tried to kill both the Baron and herself on multiple different occasions. Imagine living a life where you both hate and love the person you live with, also fearing that they're going to kill you or kill themselves. These entire conversations can be totally skipped over unless the player thoroughly selects every dialogue option. In both my playthroughs, Anna dies and Tapara goes off to join the Eternal Fire and wants nothing to do with her father ever again. So you know how you find the Baron when you return to Crow's Perch? He's hanging from a tree. In his sorrow of losing both his wife and daughter, he killed himself. It's a bitter end to the tale, and not the one The Witcher 3 shies away from. The Baron was an evil, broken man. He deserved to die, unlike Anna. He tried to hide away from the pain and suffering he had caused his family and those around him by getting so drunk for days that he couldn't remember what he had done the day before. And in the end, all that got him was the end of a rope. If I'm to choose between a greater and lesser evil, I'd rather not choose at all. Usually though, the stakes are just too damn high. Sometimes in choosing a greater evil, you do good, albeit in a small way. When I chose to save the orphans of the swamp, I couldn't know Anna would die. And I never thought the Baron would leave his wife where she lay, find a rope and hang himself. Most times, you make your choice and never look back. I'd say that I remember the Bloody Baron quest line so well was it's the one quest in The Witcher 3 that I used to describe the game to people. But it's sad to say that it's the only real quest line in the entire game, minus the DLCs, that I completely remember. I'm not saying the rest of the main quest line in The Witcher 3 is forgettable because it isn't. All I'm saying is it doesn't reach the same heights as the Bloody Baron quest line does. You know how people often say that the final suicide mission in Mass Effect 2 is memorable because everything is on the line, the characters you've gotten to know over the entire first game and second game could die because of a tactical error on your part? The Witcher 3 doesn't feel like it has big stakes. You know in the end, Geralt will find Ciri, that you'll defeat the Wild Hunt, and even though the choices you make will make an impact, if you're paying enough attention and making sure you do every important side quest that comes your way, then you'll get the best ending you possibly could get. That doesn't mean The Witcher 3's main quest isn't interesting or epic in any way, because it definitely is. It's just that the quests you go on don't feel like they have any real meaning to the overall story and stakes. You're literally fighting off the end of the world and yet it feels like I'm doing nothing to stop it. When you finish the Baron's quest, Geralt finds out that Ciri had travelled from Crow's Perch to Novigrad, so that's your next destination. 
Novigrad may be the best interpretation of a large city I've ever seen in a video game, even better than Los Santos in GTA 5 or Saint Denis in Red Dead 2. While those cities are fantastic places to explore, they never really feel alive and bustling like they're made out to be. Novigrad on the other hand never feels like this. Every street is unique and full of NPCs doing a variety of different things. It never feels bland to explore Novigrad, from the seedy lower city with its tall buildings and almost toppling over, with beggars on every street corner and people wading through their own piss and shit to the mansions and castles high above at the richer part of town, where the rich and powerful go about their day avoiding the riffrash down below. All of it is unique in its design and you can spend hours upon hours doing quests just inside the city walls. When Geralt first tries to enter Novigrad he is told the city is under lockdown, that the eternal fire is systematically hunting down every non-human and magical entity in the city and burning them alive. When Geralt is finally allowed to enter the Novigrad, you actually see a burning take place in the main square. Two sorcerers are burnt at the stake exactly like the old witch hunts back in the 1600s. The Eternal Fire even names their soldiers Witch Hunters, and it's their job to find any magical being in the city and bring them to so-called justice. Geralt has many run-ins with the Witch Hunters throughout his time in Novigrad, but the main quest is mostly focused on finding Dandelion the Bard, one of Geralt's close friends. Dandelion is actually the narrator of the cutscenes you see every time you load the game, and also the writer of the descriptions of the quests you have in the quest menu. Dandelion had helped Ciri when she had come to Novigrad from Coe's Perch. You spend your time dealing with crime lords and trying to find out what happened to Dandelion and his friends. It's an interesting enough plot. You have to go from place to place putting clues together on what exactly happened. Dandelion and Sidri had decided to pull a heist on one of the crime lords, Siggy Reuven, also known as Dijkstra, and steal his treasure and give it to Horson Jr., another member of the Big Four crime lords. In return, Jr. would fix a device for Siri. Of course, this didn't go well for either Siri or Dandelion. Siri ends up teleporting away after almost being caught, and Dandelion is captured by the city guard and is to be executed at some point in the future. So Geralt needs to wriggle his way through the ongoing tensions between the Big Four Crime Lords, the City Guard, and the Eternal Fire. It's an interesting premise, and it does lead to some genuinely interesting missions, like the one where Geralt needs to play a Witcher in a play to try to persuade a Doppler, a creature that can change its appearance on a whim, who is a friend of Dandelion to come out of hiding because he has information on where Ciri is. You actually have to study your lines before the play, and if you get it wrong, the Doppler will leave and you have to chase him down instead. If you memorize your lines, then the Doppler will reveal himself and join you when it realises you're a friend of Dandelion. Geralt is a goddamn terrible actor, but his monotone voice and barely emotive body language compared to other actors is hilarious, and the crowd loves it. This is what they think a Witcher is, an unfeeling, emotionless killing machine, and Geralt plays it perfectly. He also introduced Zoltan the Dwarf, another old friend of Geralt's, and either introduced or reintroduced to Triss Merigold. Triss, like Yennefer, is a sorceress, and she needs Geralt's help to get her and other sorceresses out of Novigrad. Triss and Geralt both have a history together, and Triss is one of the people the player can romance if they like. And while the quest she gives you is an interesting one, in the end it boils down to you either saving a lot of sorcerers or leaving two behind to die by the witch hunters. But that's not what I wanted to focus on. I want to focus on the over-sexualization of female characters in The Witcher 3. Now this might be a really weird and sudden place to talk about this issue, but I think it still needs highlighting. Video games have had a history of over-sexualizing females, there's no denying that, I think it's a problem that needs to be addressed more thoroughly in the industry, but for the sake of this argument I want to only focus on four primary female characters in The Witcher 3, that is Yennefer, Triss, Kira, and Ciri. Three of these characters, Yen, Triss, and Kira, throw themselves at Geralt at the first opportunity they get. These characters can be Geralt's love interest throughout the game and the player can pick and choose who to pursue throughout the playthrough. Now I'm not saying romances in video games are inherently a bad thing, because they're not. Bioware always did a really good job with romantic relationships in the Mass Effect and Dragon Age series, but those characters in those games never actively threw themselves at the main character. It was a natural progression. Now some people could argue that these characters in The Witcher have been built up over the book series and over the trilogy of games, and that's a fair argument, but what you can't dismiss is that The Witcher games are inherently a heterosexual male power fantasy. You play as a predetermined character as a deep and intricate backstory that already had some sort of relationship with these women, but they still immediately throw themselves at you as if they can't resist themselves. So you're telling me that three of the most powerful sorcerers who can literally teleport on a dime and cast spells that will literally shake the world around them, all flock to the same grizzled old 
old white dude. Now this is not at all a problem in just The Witcher 3. In plenty of games, women are oversexualized when men are not. I've seen arguments saying that Geralt himself is oversexualized throughout the games. The thing is, the simple bathtub scene showing Geralt naked is completely different from constantly having explicit camera angles on female characters. This also might stem from CD Projekt's Polish roots, but the small amount of research I've done, it seems like gender inequality is in a rough state in the country, so who knows what it was like when Sapowski wrote the books that the games are based on. I mean, even right now, the Polish courts have put a ban on abortions throughout the whole country. Its decision has sprouted thousands of women to protest not only the ruling, but the stranglehold the Catholic Church has over the Polish government. But what has this got to do with The Witcher? I think it's important to make parallels between the context of where and when the source material of a game is created, and how that country perceives certain social changes happening right now. In The Witcher 3's case, women are over-sexualized to the extreme. Now, it might seem like I'm nitpicking here, and I might be. I think it's important to highlight these sort of things in the games we play. The Witcher 3 is an old game, and hopefully CD Projekt learns from their mistakes here when it comes to representing women in their games does a better job of it in Cyberpunk. But the thing is, I am not hopeful for that. It seems that a lot of people in the LGBTQ community are worried about the way the transgender people are going to be represented in Cyberpunk, but we'll just have to wait and see. Back to what I was talking about before. Once you do find and save Dandelion, he recounts what happened to Ciri, but he has no idea where she went. So the wild goose chase continues. Earlier you get the option to find a boat to take you to the Isle of Skelligar, but I usually wait until I finished all my business in Valon and Novigrad to head there. Most of the side quests in Valon and Novigrad are doable before you can head to Skelligar, and in my opinion it's better to get all these missions and Witcher contracts done before you head to the next area, because Skelligar is as big as Valon and you're going to be spending a lot of time there. And while Valon and Novigrad are interesting places to explore, Skelliger is by far my favourite part of The Witcher 3. When Geralt first heads to Skellige, the game pulls the traditional boarded by pirates, then a storm hits trope that you see in a lot of Hollywood pirate films. Geralt gets thrown overboard and wakes up on the shores of Ard Skellig. While Valen may be a traditional European medieval setting, Skellige is a complete Viking setting. It's a pole opposite to the warring empires of the mainland. Here in Skellige, the people are separated into clans, but there is an overall king of them all. When you first went your way to Kaer Troll from the beach Geralt washed up on, it's an incredible sight. The castle is actually carved into the cliff face of a huge mountain, and the town underneath is at the bottom of a ravine, hundreds of feet below it. If the towers and spires of Novigrad or something to gawk at. Kertrode is looking at something out of Lord of the Rings. It really is that magical. There really isn't a place in Valon that screams fantasy. Everything is sort of based on what a realistic medieval European landscape and city would be. But here in Skellige, things are done differently. And it shows even through the architecture and landscape. It's too bad your time in Skellige is pretty short-lived for the main story. However, if you're only following the main plot and actively avoiding the side content, you will only really need to do a few main quests to continue the story. And that's a huge bummer. If you do go out of your way to finish the side content, you'll find that Skellige is full of secrets to find, new equipment to unlock, and mythic monsters to slay. But the most interesting part of all this is the way you travel in Skellige. Most of your adventuring will be done using a boat, and it's a goddamn blessing in my opinion. I've avoided talking about how downright awful the controls are for Roach until now because I didn't know if I was in the minority of people who find it that way. A few people who I had talked to and the amount of forums I read through to see if I wasn't the only one who had the same problems as me. There was a few people, but a lot of people seemed to think it was our problem that Roach was stopping every time we had to run over a rock or run past a fence. I'm going to say it. I think The Witcher 3 has by far the worst horse riding I've ever seen in a video game. It got so bad that I sometimes preferred to run everywhere because it was simpler than trying to cross country with a horse that stops at the slightest hill or incline. Red Dead Redemption has better horse riding than this and that game came out 5 years before Witcher 3 did. How is that even possible? In the 5 years since the game release, CD Projekt never fully fixed it. It's the only part of the entire game that I can confidently say is absolutely 
awful. It actually ruins part of the core experience. You need Roach to get you everywhere in Valon and Novigrad. I even tried playing with the controls a bit. I turned off the automatic run option, which is the easiest form of travel by the way, and that doesn't fix it because you suddenly have to worry about Roach's stamina going down while in automatic mode, Roach never gets tired. So turning it off actively makes an already terrible experience even worse. That's why exploring by boat is a far more enjoyable experience. You don't need to worry about the boat suddenly stopping, and you can actively see where you're going when you're on the water. Yes, you do need Roach on Skylager sometimes, when exploring Ard Skellig, but otherwise everything is within walking or running distance. And that's the best thing about it. When using Roach, everything seems to blur by at an accelerated speed, you never really get to stop and stare at the intricate details that CD Projekt put into the world. The skyboxes are by far my favourite part with their swirling colours that change the time and day and the weather that passes overhead. Skelliger has these sort of moments all the time, you just see much more of it without Roach. Other than the main quest, the side content in Skellige is by far some of my favourite parts of The Witcher 3, other than the Bloody Baron quest line. It takes the best parts of The Witcher universe and puts them into content that some players may never see. Do you want political intrigue? Check, these missions have that. Do you want a good mystery? Check, they have that as well. Do you want to fight mythical monsters? Well, they have that too. The quests mostly focus around the two heirs of the throne of Ard Crate. The old king has died and it's time to name a successor, but both the heirs, Helmer and Ceres, have decided to prove themselves by going on dangerous expeditions and proving that they are the true heirs to the throne. So of course Geralt is asked by their father to find them. Helmer has decided to lead a hunting party to try and kill the legendary giant the Lord of Unvik, one of the islands off the mainland, but hasn't been heard from since, while Ceres is off to Spike Rude to help the Jarl there to get rid of a curse that haunts him. So players have an option to make. You can help both of them, or just one, or neither of them. But I think you'll be missing out on a fundamental part of the Witcher 3 experience if you only did one or neither. These quests take you to other main islands in Skellige, and they're both varied in every way they play out. If you go into Helmer first, then you'll find the clues of his hunting party all over the place, a body here and a blood trail over there that you need to follow. In the end, there are only three survivors of the hunting party left, including Helmer. You can see that the giant has been here a long time, and he is even trying to build a boat to get to the mainland so he must be stopped either way. You and one of Hjelman's companions that you saved find Hjelman near the giant's lair. He tells you that one of his other companions, Vicky the Loon, decided to go and try and slay the giant by himself. And you do actually find him, but he's been captured in a cage right next to where the giant is sleeping. You have the option to either sneak to the giant and get his key to unlock the cage, or you can just fight the giant outright. But if you don't get the key first, then halfway through your fight with the giant, you'll pick up the cage like a mace, and in the process, absolutely eviscerating Viggy. In the end, you defeat the giant, and Helmer and his companions return to Ard Skelliger. Serious Quest, on the other hand, isn't as big or epic as Helmer's, but is equally as interesting. The curse that has gripped the Jarl is leaving a serious effect on him and almost driving him mad, so who better to help him rid of a curse than a Witcher? Ceres is by far a more likeable character than Helmer. She's not as hot-headed as her brother, but when she gets her mind stuck on something, she won't stop until she sees it through, and it shows in this quest. Everyone thinks there is no helping the Jarl, but Ceres is so determined to help him that she won't return to Ard Skellig until she does. You meet Ceres near the Jarl's abandoned hut. The curse actually turns out to be him, a creature that attaches itself to a host when they're full of guilt and feeds off it by making the person hurt themselves. You can fight the him, or try and trick the him instead. To trick the him, the creature must transfer itself willingly to another host that has more guilt than the person that's currently haunting. If the new person suddenly realises that whatever they did wasn't true, then they no longer feel guilty and the creature will be banished. If you trust Siri, she'll tell you to light the oven in the kitchen and head off into town for an unknown reason while Geralt waits in the abandoned house. Sometime later, Siri comes bursting in with a baby in her arm. The Jarl's baby to be in fact, and Honono heals as the Jarl and his guards. Ceres then throws Geralt the baby and says, put the baby in the oven. You're given a short amount of time to decide whether you should or not, but if you do, the Jarl will tell his guards to kill you, and he will start weeping and screaming on the ground as he tries to open the locked oven door. After fighting the guards for a while, the Jarl's screams have become a whimper. The him will transfer itself to Geralt, who just murdered a baby by cooking it alive. But then, you probably guessed it, Ceres walked into the kitchen with the actual baby in her arms. It was a bait and switch. The him realises this and is banished by Geralt. After her job is done, Ciri leaves to head back to Ard Skellig. But that isn't the end of your time with Crate. 
seats. Geropactyl gets to choose who becomes the next king of the high seat of Ard Skellig. Most RPGs give you a choice to change the world around you, but The Witcher 3 usually does this subtly. But at the end of this quest chain, you decide who becomes king. I chose Ceres, of course, in both my playthroughs, actually. She seems level-headed enough not to order a preemptive strike on the Nilfgaardians like her brother might, and with the other Yarls going restless about a coming war with Nilfgaard, it's a good thing there is another perspective leading Skellige. I still think that more time should have been spent in Skellige in the main story. These couple of quests have only taken up a fraction of the side content that this part of the game has to offer. I just don't think it was utilised as well as it should have been. Geralt does return to Skellige once more at the end of the game. Before we get into that, let's talk about... Leveling up in video games has been a staple of the medium since the early days of arcade machines. Modern games use the same method as a way of rewarding the player for playing the game and finishing certain requirements. It gives players that small hit of dopamine that drives them to keep playing and leveling up their character, and The Witcher 3 is no different, but its leveling system is slightly different from a lot of other games. Most modern RPGs will give you experience points, and you can use those experience points put into skills that make your character more powerful or unique in a certain field. That be lockpick or casting spells or being able to use a two-handed weapon. Usually you'll be able to use those skills to your heart's content. The Witcher 3 doesn't work this way. You still gain these experience points, but instead of unlocking a skill and being able to use it freely, the player can only pick a small number of abilities to be usable at one time. So the player needs to be particular about what skills they want to be able to use. You can switch these out of course, but a lot of skills are super helpful to have on at all times, like ones that give you extra vitality. And that leads me onto mutagens. Mutagens are used to enhance the selected abilities. The more powerful the mutagen, the more you'll get out of your abilities. It's a simple system and it works well. You have the freedom to go absolutely crazy with your builds. Do you want to only use signs? then you can use up all your blue mutagens and use all just sign abilities. Or do you want to be a master swordsman like Geralt is meant to be and use crazy moves on your enemies? And that's fine as well. But I do have a few problems with it. Firstly, the leveling system is built around the idea of Geralt being a powerful warrior, but for him to fight big monsters, he needs to prepare for those fights. And for the game's sake, those enemies are going to be more powerful than Geralt when you first get a quest to kill one. But what happens if you skip a quest? What happens if you come back hours upon hours later and you manage to kill a supposedly powerful enemy in two hits, but when you run across a bunch of drowners you almost immediately get killed. That's why the leveling system doesn't really scale to the world around you. In most modern RPGs when you level up you become more powerful than the simple enemies that you fought at the start of the game. Games get around this by either adding stronger enemies to take more hits or making older enemies more powerful with better gear than attacks. The Witcher 3 doesn't really do this. Most enemies do the same attacks they had at the start of the game with the same damage meaning that it doesn't feel like Geralt has had a power increase at all, but the level-based enemies aren't scaled and stay the same. You obviously still feel better equipped than what you did at the start of the game with your better skills, weapons and armour, but you could probably go the entire game without delving into the upgrade system and still be fine. The weapons and armour is also one of the worst aspects of the RPG systems in The Witcher 3. All weapons and armour needs to be constantly constantly replace with something better if you want to make it easier for yourself to defeat enemies. I'd say every few hours you're receiving a couple of different swords and maybe a new piece of armour that's slightly better than what you're currently running. Now that wouldn't be too bad in a game like Destiny, would it? In Destiny you're able to upgrade those weapons and armour that you like so you can use that gear at higher levels, but not in The Witcher 3. A piece of armour or a weapon can become completely redundant as soon as you pick up a new piece of gear. I've had this happen so many times while playing The Witcher 3. I've either finished a quest or crafted a really unique sword and the next chest I loot in some underground cave suddenly has a better sword that has far better stats and is way better than the weapon that just took me hours to get. CD Projekt might have wanted players to keep using different weapons so they don't just use the best sword they can find in the game for an entire playthrough, but the weapons in The Witcher 3 aren't unique in any way except for stats, the number of ruins you can put in it, and its name, so it's pointless having every single weapon or army you pick up be immediately more powerful than the one you currently have equipped. Armour is even worse. You're telling me that this badass looking armour I currently have on is way worse than this armour I picked up from some random bandit camp I cleared. You've got to be kidding me. 
It's onto your end game activities in the DLC that you end up getting Mastercrafter gear that is the best in the game and worth actually keeping. It's a system that is completely broken and I don't know why they implemented it like this. And all that would have been fixed if the game allowed players to upgrade their gear so it levels with them like other RPGs. Again, hopefully in Cyberpunk they've learnt their lesson and this is different. The final few quests in The Witcher 3 go by in a blur, but some of the best stuff in the game and most of it actually isn't even open world, but a tight linear experience. With his leads basically all but gone, Geralt, with the help of Yennefer, realises that the weird creature Uma, who Geralt had met the Bloody Barons fort, might be connected to Ciri in some way, or even might be Ciri, somehow transformed into a hideous creature. So Geralt decides to take him to Caer Morhen, the school of the wolf's castle, and Geralt's home, so Yennefer can perform a spell and hopefully rid Uma of his Curse. The entire Kiyomura section of the game is an absolute delight to play. You meet Eskel and maybe for the first time Lambert. Here's where things get interesting. Earlier you could find Lambert and help him with a quest, and if you do, unique dialogue becomes available to you. You help both of them with odd jobs around the castle. You help Lambert charge the magical item that has to be used in the transformation of Uma, and you help Eskel kill a forktail that is hunting around the area. And after all that hard work is done, there's nothing else for the witches to do but get absolutely pissed off their faces drunk. It's probably one of the silliest parts of the game other than Geralt being in the play. Eskel at one point is sent to go get more drinks and doesn't return, so Geralt needs to use his witcher senses to try and find him while drunk. You find him outside with his goat sprawled on the ground. Lambert also joins you and remarks they should go use Jennifer's megaphone and call one of the sorcerers as a prank. It's all in good fun, there's a real fun break from all the dreariness and monster slaying in the last 60 plus hours that you've played. It reminds me a lot of the Citadel DLC from Mass Effect 3, where Shepard and his companions all have a party at the end of a ridiculous story involving an evil clone of Shepard. At the party in that DLC, the player has time to go around and talk to your companions one last time before the big climb battle, and this feels exactly like that. It's actually the last bit of fun the characters have in The Witcher 3 before the end and the last battle with the Wild Hunt. When Yennefer does perform the spell, Uma turns into Avalark, the elf that was travelling with Ciri before she became lost. He points you to the Isle of Mists in Skalligar, and that's where he took Ciri after her last confrontation with the Wild Hunt. You do find her there, and so Geralt and Ciri are reunited, but not before the game makes you think that Ciri is dead. It's seriously a shocking moment. There's a part of me when I first saw this didn't quite believe that CD Projekt would kill her off right as Geralt finds her, but still isn't any less impactful. Geralt has scoured the entire continent trying to find her, and so has the player, but to find her possibly dead after all of that is almost too much for both Geralt and the player to handle. But of course she's alive. The Wild Hunt is still after her though, and the only way to protect her is to take her back to Kiermor and, and fight the Wild Hunt on Geralt's own ground. So you gather your friends and allies and await the Wild Hunt at Kiermor, maybe for the final time. But of course it's not. The game practically says to the player, tricked ya, as the defense of the castle goes horribly wrong. Even with your combined forces, the Wild Hunt still breaks through and finds Ciri, but not before Vesemir tries to protect Ciri by getting himself killed in the process. It's here we see how powerful Ciri is. In her sorrow, she lets out an ear-splitting scream, which becomes a powerful magical explosion, or implosion I guess. It forces the Wild Hunt to retreat or otherwise be destroyed by Ciri's incredible outburst of power. It's not until Ciri exhausts herself that her powerful energy blast stops, and the day is won, sort of. The Battle for Caer Morhen is an exciting part of the entire Witcher 3 experience, but also shows the pacing problems of the story. From the start of the game, we've had one big objective find Ciri before the Wild Hunt does, and Geralt succeeds in doing that, so the battle for Caer Morhen almost feels like an ending. You've gathered your friends and allies for this last final battle against an army that is certain to overwhelm everyone, but when you win, the story isn't yet finished. While a lot of other games, mainly Bioware RPGs, would have had this as the last stand, the last battle before the big bad boss is finally defeated once and for all, but that doesn't happen in The Witcher 3. It's why Vesemir's death feels so weird at this point in the story. It feels like his death was only used to give Ciri motivation to try and fight the Hunt head on instead of trying to run away and let other people protect her. That is good motivation, and I'm not saying it's bad writing at all on CD Projekt's part, but it's super cliche to have a death of a character make the main character stand up and do what needs to be done. 
I've heard a lot of people complain that The Witcher 3 is too long, and I agree in some parts of that assessment, and I think CD Projekt do as well. Not a lot of people finish The Witcher 3, and that's why Cyberpunk 2077 is going to be a smaller experience overall, but a little bit more intricate and dense. Up until the battle at Kaer and The Witcher 3 has followed a pretty basic three-act structure, but after the battle, the story needs to answer all these questions and wrap up storylines, as well as force the player to make decisions with Siri that will completely change the ending of the game depending on those choices and Siri's also ultimate fate. There's a lot to do there in such a small amount of time. Here's basically what happens in the last few chapters before the final battle. Geralt and Ciri travel together to Valon to find the Crones and Imlorith, the elf that had killed Vesemir when the Wild Hunt attacked Kaer Morhen. Geralt kills Imlorith, but Ciri only manages to kill two of the Crones, the last one escapes. You bring back the Lodger Sorcerers and convince them to help you fight the Wild Hunt. You helped Dijkstra and Philippa Eilhart, the leader of the Lodger Sorcerers, assassinate King Radovid, essentially winning the war for Nilfgaard. You basically decide whether you let Ciri make her own decisions and let her frustrations out, or be an overbearing father figure to her because you're worried she might do something wrong. These decisions ultimately decide Ciri's fate and whether she looks up to you or not, but these decisions are not shown to the player to be game-altering at all. On one hand, this may be a problem because a player might be too protective of Ciri because they care about her as a character, but in being too protective, you might end up getting her killed for no reason. You investigate Avalark's laboratory because Ciri is worried that he's hiding something from her, but you find out he's not, but he's partly obsessed with Ciri's elder blood lineage and the powers they give her. You also find that the Anel, the elves, hate Ciri for her blood and powers. Geralt and Avalark travel through magical doorways to try and get to the world of the elves, but the doors are random, and Geralt and Avalark are separated on multiple occasions. This is the first time you see the other worlds Ciri might have travelled to using her powers, and Geralt also sees firsthand what the White Frost does to worlds once it destroys them. Once you do get to the world of the elves, Geralt and Avalark convince Eredin, the leader of the Wild Hunt's right hand man, that Eredin was the one that assassinated the former king of the elves, and which his right hand was a devout supporter of. He promises Geralt and Avalark that when the final battle does come and Eredin calls for reinforcements, no elves will come to his aid. Philippa Eilhart and Geralt head to an old elven ruin to recover the Sunstone, an ancient relic that will help call the Wild Hunt to wherever the stone is so they can trap the Wild Hunt and force them into battle. You do all of this in the last few chapters of the game, and it feels out of place. You only really now learn information on Ciri's elder blood powers, and you only find out at the very end of the game that Ciri has the power to stop the White Frost, not just defeat the Wild Hunt. This is such a weird way to go about it, not once throughout the entire playthrough is it mentioned that Ciri can stop the White Frost, but she does it single-handedly. The final battle of the game is probably one of the most disappointing parts of The Witcher 3. Most of it is just spent playing as Geralt as you try and find Ciri in the chaos of the battle between the Wild Hunt, the North Guardians, and the armies of Skelligar. There are Wild Hunt Knights everywhere, but I realised early on that you don't even need to really fight in these parts. You can simply run straight past them all in your pursuit of Ciri. There's no need to help the men that you're fighting alongside unless you want to feel like you're actually doing something. But it's pointless. The enemies are endlessly respawning, and the men you're fighting alongside are quickly replaced when one dies. You eventually find yourself face to face with Eridan, and the fight is intense. It's probably one of the more difficult fights in The Witcher 3, but it's not really as difficult as, say, a griffin or a troll you might have to kill for a Witcher contract earlier in the game. Eridan does the same attacks over and over again in the same order, so you know when to dodge and when to try and get close for an attack. You eventually whittle his health down to zero, then the day is won, but not really. In the chaos and confusion of the battle, Avalark and Ciri had made their way to an elven tower in the distance, and Geralt and Yennefer see a large beam of energy firing high into the sky just like Ciri had done at Kaer Morhen. Before Eredin died, he told Geralt that Avalark had plans for Ciri, that he had an ultimate motive this whole time. He was going to use Ciri to bring about the second conjunction of the spheres, the event that had led the worlds between monsters and men to collide thousands of years before, but this time bring over the world of the elves. So Geralt and Yennefer rush up the mountain towards the tower, but not before an awful horse ride through a large battlefield full of monsters. Geralt that makes his way into the tower. Here you confront Avalark, preparing to kill him, but then Ciri comes out and reveals that this was all her plan, that she can use the conjunction of the spheres to stop the White Frost once and for all, and she does exactly that, but depending on how you treated her throughout the last few chapters, Ciri could either die or live. 
This is what I mean by The Witcher 3 is paced weirdly. We never found out this information, even the fact that Ciri can stop the White Frost at all until just this moment, and you don't even see how Ciri stops it anyway. You see her walking towards a shining light in the blizzard, and her remembering her time with Geralt. Are we to simply believe her elder blood can just stop the frost? Or did Avalark teach her a powerful spell while he was training her? It's never explicitly said. And the decisions you make for Ciri were made in a very short amount of time, and it's really the only important decisions in the entire game. Yes, sure, other decisions with other side characters are important, and we see how those characters' lives turned out after the ending of the game, but the important one is Ciri. Dictating what happens at the end of the game solely on these couple of dialogue options makes the ending feel unfulfilling. RPGs are built around player agency and decision making, but The Witcher 3 fails at that when it comes to how the game decides which ending you should get. There's no karma system in the game that tracks whether Geralt is honourable or not. Did you spend the entire game dismissing people to ask your help, or did you go out of your way to help everyone you can? And did you talk to Ciri about other things outside of those important decisions? The game doesn't really track any of these things, and because of that, the ending feels like you didn't have any control over it. There are three possible endings for The Witcher 3. Ciri dies and Geralt becomes an unfeeling monster slayer, exactly what the public perception of witches are, and he hunts down the final crone to get his revenge. Or Ciri becomes Empress of Nilfgaard, and her and Geralt spend some time together with Zoltan and Dandelion and White Orchard until she leaves for Nilfgaard or what's considered the best ending, in which Ciri becomes a witcher just like Geralt. It's considered the canon ending to the story, considering how we see Ciri in promotional material for the Witcher's 10th anniversary trailer wearing her witcher outfit and not an empress outfit, but more on that in the DLC videos. The ending is inherently a happy one. Geralt gets to spend time with his adopted daughter and teaches her everything he knows about being a witcher. While overall, I feel that the story of The Witcher 3 is really well told, it still falls short on the second half, and that almost ruins the entire experience. There's a part of me that wishes that the entire game had been a little bit shorter and followed a more traditional structure. Maybe finding Ciri earlier on so then you can help her decide who she wants to be, then it doesn't feel as rushed and thrown together like it does in the game. Most traditional fantasy stories have a reason for the events to be happening. The Lord of the Rings has the destruction of the ring as its central plot point, and all the other events revolve around finding a way to destroy it and keep it out of Sauron's grasp. In the Stormlight Archive series by Brad and Sanderson, the events are even closer to the events of The Witcher 3. There's an Everstorm. Get it? White Frost, Everstorm, same sort of thing? That's approaching that will bring about the events that will destroy humankind all over the planet. But unlike the White Frost, the Everstorm is hinted to the reader throughout the first and second books, so when it does arrive, it's a considered a huge event. But The Witcher 3 acts like this end of all of everything event isn't a big deal, and all it will take to stop is a really powerful being to just walk into it. This sort of event needs to have some sort of world building behind it to back it up. But The Witcher 3 does none of this, and it ultimately leads to an anticlimactic ending. Even sadder though is the fact that we never actually see Ciri after this point. She's not in Kaer Morhen, we end up after you finish, or anywhere else. And she doesn't even show up at the end of the DLC. Ciri is a complicated character, and she's ultimately the main protagonist of The Witcher 3. It is her story, but that story is told too quickly and is too rushed to make it seem as important as CD Projekt intended it to be. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is a fantastic game, there's no doubt about it. You can see the love and care and passion that CD Projekt put into the game. They love the universe of The Witcher and it shows. Ultimately, it's an experience I think everyone should have if you love the medium of video games, or fantasy, or RPGs. It's a must play, there's no doubt about that. I recently finished another fantasy series, but not a video game. It was Stephen King's The Dark Tower series. I walked away from those books an absolute mess. I've never had such a visceral reaction to finishing a series before. I felt angry, exhausted, and terribly, terribly sad at the end of those books. 
King even directly talks to you at the second last chapter to explicitly tell the reader that they shouldn't read the final chapter. There is no point in continuing on, and that if you read these books solely to see what happens at the end, then you've completely missed the point of the story, and that you should have just slipped to the last page in the bookstore and read the ending there instead of wasting your time. And he's right. It's not about the destination, but the journey, because the ending will only leave you feeling sad and dissatisfied. I think that's how I feel about the ending of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Everything you do in the game, from side quests to Witcher contracts, the amount of Gwent games you play, is all so much fun that playing through the main game to see the ending seems pointless. The games industry and a lot of players are fixated on trying to finish everything, to try and 100% every game they play to get their money out of it. There's nothing wrong with that, I do it on occasion as well, but I don't think you need to complete The Witcher 3 to get something out of it. It's so jam-packed full of good, solid content that just finishing it is going to leave you feeling dissatisfied. Plus, I never really wanted to finish The Witcher 3 on my first playthrough. It's so much fun to play that I didn't want to put the controller down, because I knew that once I rolled those credits for a final time, that I would never come back and play it again. Never again will I ever have that same experience. I did read the last chapter of The Dark Tower, by the way, even against King's warnings, and... He was inevitably right, because of course he was. Endings are heartless. Ending is just another word for goodbye.